You are listening to the Fly the W670 podcast. It's season number two. It's episode 89, Cubs free agent pitching options for 2024. Don't forget to listen, download, review. Most importantly, subscribe to our podcast. Follow us on the socials. Fly the W670 on Twitter, Instagram, and Fly the W on Facebook, or email us at Fly the W670 at gmail.com. Well, Crowley, happy uh, week of Thanksgiving. Hope you had a good weekend. I want to hear about your uh, autograph hounding. I saw on social media that you were uh, first in line for Kyle Schwarber. We'll get to that in a few minutes, but uh, hopefully you're having a good week so far. Yeah, the, the Chicago Sports Spectacular, uh, for those of you that listened to the last podcast, we had uh, Kevin Schwartz on. It was an absolute blast. Uh, a lot of Cubs there, and so, um, you know, I, I got to do – unfortunately, it's not hounding because I, I have to pay for it. Uh, but, <laughs> it, you know, it would be a lot better if it was free. But, you know, hey, these things cost money, and, and when you pay them, they actually do exactly what you ask for the most part. So um, it was cool. You know, I got to talk a little bit to Kyle Schwarber, uh, Araldus Chapman. I mean, the, the dude is just huge. Addison Russell was there. Really? Uh, Addison Russell was there? Oh yeah! Wow! Oh, yeah. oh he uh, a lot of people trying to get those team signed now, pieces. You don't mind me asking? And now you brought this up, and, and, yeah. and you know, uh, so two part question: What did you have Addison Russell sign? That probably mm-hmm. isn't the secret of question. But w- what does one? What does an Addison Russell get to charge for an autograph these days? So uh, he, I did um, with all of these signings there's all kind of different tiered prices. So if you get an eight by 10 photo and a baseball, they're roughly the same. And then it goes up 11 by 14, 16 by 20. Okay. So size of the item changes things. Or right. Like, game a jer- use- like a Jersey's different, right? Right. Game. U- uh, Jersey's a premium. Any game use stuff are premium stuff like that. So it okay. all depends. I got an 11 by 14 signed and I think it was like 60, 70 bucks. Okay. Um, I didn't know if maybe it was like a, a world, like a, a piece that you were trying to fill out. Like, a, yeah, that's, that, that's what it was. It was a, it's, um, it's, it was given out to all the season ticket holders on season ticket holder day in 2017. Okay. The Cubs had seven representatives that year in the all-star in the 2016 all-star year game. Right. And so in 2017, they gave us a picture of all the uh, all-stars holding the Jersey. So it is, and I have it signed by Zobris, Lester, Russell and Dexter Fowler. So still missing Arietta. Yeah, still missing Arietta, Bryant, and Rizzo. So okay, so maybe the three hardest, right? Um, you never know. Uh, Rizzo did a private signing in the summer, and Chris Bryant did a private. Now, when you're a private, you don't get to attend. So that's what, a difference. That, what does that mean when you're a private? Uh, that means you're going to send it in, and someone's going to have it sent. Ah, uh, so you, you so you would send your item off. Correct. And then the item would be coming back to you. So no Correct. pictures, no small talk. Nope. None of that okay. stuff. All right. Pure um, business. Now, if you were, now let me ask you this. Now, now we're off on a tangent, but that's okay. I think hopefully the listeners will find this interesting. Um, if, if there was, and hopefully there is, cause I want you to get your stuff done. If there is a Brian or Rizzo private that you know about two part question, is that the item that's going and are you limited to one item or it's as much as you want to spend? As much as you want to spend. Okay. It's, it's, now, if, I mean, you only, if, if you only have like one thing you could get signed by Rizzo or Bryant based on the price point, are you finishing that piece or would you want an individual thing? Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty good. It would probably be that piece if it was just one thing because I do have a lot of Rizzo and Bryant signed stuff. Oh, you've already so, got that stuff. Okay. Well, I yeah. didn't know you already had them signed on stuff. Okay. Oh, well, yeah. Then, okay. Most the only guys I'm really lacking on, and even that is not a lot. Um, you know, I need Sutcliffe on a couple of things, but the one guy, the unicorn for everybody is John Lackey. And he I was just going to guess will that. Not sign. I guess that he will not a, sign. He's a strange bird. He has been offered large sums of money to just sit in his house. Like people are going to fly and bring things and give him gobs of money. From what I hear, yeah. he still won't do it. And so, and is it just, just to be a, a, uh, uh, you know what? I mean, what, what's the, is there a reason behind it? Is I he just always, don't think he's he always been this way. Is there like, is there like John Lackey Cardinal stuff out there? Or is let, there let, let me ask you a question. Would you feel comfortable walking up to John Lackey and asking him to sign something? No, I but mean, I didn't I mean, know if like the Cardinals <laughs> did something like Cubs con, if they did like Cardinals fest or something. And if, 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 I'm, I'm not saying that he didn't in his career. I wouldn't know that. I'm trying okay. to remember from his Cubs con. I know. I think he only went to one Cubs convention. Um, he was a Cub, what, 2016, 2017. And so, 
I remember, I think, I believe he was there 2016. Yeah, he was there 2016. I don't remember him signing. And then 2017, he wasn't there. Him and Lackey went golfing instead. Right. Or uh, Lester, sorry. All right, well, we just talked about some pitchers, so let's get back on track. And we are talking about the uh, free agent class, those pitchers that could be on the bump for the Cubs in the coming up season. Right. Now, if you remember on the last podcast, we talked about the non-tender deadline that occurred on Friday. I thought um, that, you know, I said, look out for wisdom. I said, look out for Cody Hewer. And I can't remember the third guy I said to look out, but I, I, I had a feeling their goal was to get it down to 37, which is what they did. So a couple things that ended up happening, they did tender Patrick wisdom, a deal. I so was Patrick surprised. Wisdom, by, I was surprised by that. I was surprised. Yep. yep. So Patrick wisdom was, they worked out a new deal. So they had six arbitration eligible players that were tendered contracts. Alzali lighter, Magical, Julian Merriweather, Justin Steele, and Mike Talkman. Now, without getting into the details, all of that stuff has to be worked out by a certain date, and then then all of a sudden, if it doesn't, it has to go through arbitration. That goes not the there arbitrator. Yet. Okay. Yeah, we're not there yet, but they were offered, and that's where the Cubs had to start. The Cubs and Patrick Wisdom, they did not. They offered him a completely separate contract. That's not going in front of arbitration. That's two point seven five million dollar contract for twenty twenty four. Um, you know, with all the infielders, it was a surprise a little bit, but when you talk about the lack of power and you don't know what's going to happen this off season, especially with Cody uh -huh. Bellinger, uh -huh. you may want to keep, it wouldn't hurt to keep him around for 2.75. Right. Because you could play him at third, you can play him at first. And if he got real desperate, you could play him in a corner outfield spot. Correct. And center. I guess he did play a little center field, right? Very little, but yeah, you don't want him there. Um, the, the Cubs non-tendered three players. Right-handed pitcher Cody Hewer, him and Nick Magical were in that trade to you know with Craig Kimbrell and he just injuries. Uh, Left-handed pitcher Brandon Hughes was the surprise for me. Yeah, and then right-handed pitcher Ethan Roberts. So Hughes and Roberts both were not yet eligible for arbitration, but they're 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 dropped from the forty-man. And so these are you know that's a little bit tough now at this point. So what happens now? is Hewer, Hughes, and Roberts are all free agents. That means they whoever's the highest bidder, they can go to. So the Cubs no longer have exclusivity to those guys like they do now with Alzali and Leiter and Magical, Julian Merriweather. They're going to work arbitration. They're going to go through that process, but no one other than the Cubs are really going to sign them. Um, but Roberts, Hughes, and, and, and uh, Hewer, they could potentially be back with the Cubs, but that would mean that nobody else wanted to offer them a better contract. Gotcha. And so that's kind of where we are right now. And so at this point, we, we were down to 37. And that's the question is, who is going to fill the remaining three slots? So there's a couple ways we can do this. You can do it with free agents. You can do it with trades. Or you can promote somebody from within the farm system. So, Dustin, in this episode, we're going to look at the free agent market, specifically the pitching. And so before we even get started with free agency, we, we want to kind of get an idea uh, of budget, right? And, and, and again, these guys don't have to tell you exactly what they're going to do. But the idea is, is that, you know, are they willing to go over that luxury tax, which I believe right. is right now around $237 million. So their payroll in 2023 was about $189 million. That put them roughly around 11th place in payroll behind the Atlanta Braves. But everybody see, else looking at this uh, graph, it's a great graph, Crowley. Everybody else is way is north of 200 million. Right. So you could see that the Mets completely blew through that. And that's where people are mad at Steve Cohen, especially guys like Jerry Reinsdorf. He completely obliterated it. The Yankees right. I mean, were, no, I mean, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're like, like one and a half times the Cubs. Um, yeah, well, the, the Mets are ridiculous. Right. The Yankees, you know, the Yankees are at 275 Padres go down to 250, but you're going to see them drop Rangers are at 251 Phillies, 245. We know yeah, the but they're Phillies going spend. up and the Phillies are going up, right? Dodgers at 240 Houston, 237. So you see a lot of playoff teams on here, obviously, you know, not all of them made it, but you see the Rangers and the Phillies and the Dodgers and the Astros, um, the Blue Jays were the Angels the got the worst Braves. return on investment there, looking at the winning percentage. Oh, yeah. What they placed, what they spent. <laughs> you know? 
So here's what we're looking at right here for 2024 payroll. Right now, the Cubs are seventh. Okay, so guys, you know, leave, free agents leave, contracts get off the books, all that stuff. And so the Cubs are roughly at about like what, 168? Yep. And so they're at seventh place right now. Now, there are a couple retained salaries, which drive you nuts, but still going to have to pay Trey Mancini seven. Cody Bellinger is going to get a $5 million bonus. Uh, for the opt out, and then the uh, Tucker Barnhart three million, Brad Boxberger eight hundred thousand dollars. So that's good. That's uh, good walking away money though for uh, Bellinger, right? Like, right. You know, I, I, I don't. That part I don't understand why how that gets negotiated in. I mean, that's good negotiating by well. Let me let me take MLBPA right. and whatnot. I mean, so that that money might actually be off the books. I'd have to double check one more time because that might have been the club option. Not the player option, so okay. I'll double check. I on mean, that, that just seems like a lot of dough to walk to to walk away when you knew he was probably going to walk away anyway. So right, so my my guess is probably if I'm just guessing on it, 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 it that one probably he's not going to get that right now. So okay. we'll we'll see. If I look at the, I'm going to see if I can pull up the retained on the whites on the Cubs. I mean, again, not the end of the world. It's just something that kind of jumps off the page at you that you're paying that. I mean, I understand the Trey Mancini. He had a two-year deal, right? Right. He, and you decide to get rid of him. Okay, I can get that. But why in the world would you let Bellinger get $5.5 million to go somewhere else if that's, ends up what, if that's what ends up My, happening? That, to me, I, when I'm thinking about it, sounds like the club option. So the Cubs could have paid to be out of that $5 million. Okay. Um, So if I'm looking at this right now, though, you are roughly about what 30, 60 million under the salary cap, right? Yeah, the luxury tax. There is no the luxury salary. tax. Sorry, sorry, luxury tax, luxury tax. That yeah. that's pretty good, you know, money to play around with here. Right. Um, but when it comes to this season's free agent market, you, the starting pitcher, I think, is better than starting pitching market is better than the hitter. So we're gonna look at all the top free agents, but right now, just the pitching. And the list we're working off comes from Jim Bowden of the Athletic. I kind of took a look at some of the top pitchers. I didn't do all of them because there's a lot of free agent pitchers. And and here's what we know, right? The Cubs are looking for a front end starter, like a number one or a number two. So especially after Stroman opted out of his final year of his contract. And so when I was looking at these lists of guys that are out there and and kind of going through it, I didn't pick guys up like Johnny Cueto. You know what I mean? He's not a front end starter anymore. Right. That's not a guy that you would, you'd put in there. So the guys I really wanted to focus on were the ones that I really thought the Cubs might go after. The first big name came off the board this weekend when the Phillies and Aaron Nola agreed to seven years, $172 million, keeping the Phillies first round draft pick from 2014 in Philadelphia. And then today, Dustin, a flurry of moves, the Atlanta Braves signed former White Sox swingman, I would say free agent Reynaldo Lopez to a three year, $30 million contract. So but still good dough, good dough for Reynaldo Lopez. I mean, it's like, right. You know, I mean, right. And, and, if and starter bullpen guy, right. Good, good, good money. If you can get it. And then Lance Lynn is going to make 10 million for one year, prove it deal with the Cardinals. So two, former White Sox now, now gone off the market, but you know, the Cardinals are in on, on a lot of pitchers, supposedly that's what they said. Um, how many they land don't know, but you know, looking at this, I also didn't put in Clayton Kershaw because you know what he's doing. He's he's one more year. He'll do it with the Dodgers for sure. I'm guessing. Uh, the other is Julio Urias, who I thought the Cubs were going to make a run at, but he received a second domestic violence infraction. So obviously the Cubs are not going to scratch him. Nope. Dustin, for this episode, I did not put Shohei Otani on there. I know he, he he's the dual threat and all of that, but le- he's not pitching next year, regardless. No. In the future, you know, that's up for debate, and there's a lot of people talking about it right now, but we'll talk about him more next episode when we get to the hitters. Um, but the big, big news today is Yoshinobu Yamamoto. He is, to me, the top of the list when it comes to pitching. He plays for the Oryx Buffaloes, and he was posted today. Now, here's if you don't know how this works, players from Japan's top league, the Nippon uh, Professional Baseball League, who do not have nine years of professional experience to gain international free agency can request to be posted. So that has happened, Dustin. He is now posted. So all 30 MLB clubs have 45 days to negotiate with him on, uh, after, right now. And if no agreements reach in the time frame, he has to go back to 
the Buffaloes for another season. Okay. So the deal has to be done no later than 4 p.m. Central Time on January 4th. So just off of the math on that, Dustin, there's all these elevators the more the deal goes up. So the team that signed him to what we're going to assume is a nine-figure deal is going to pay Oryx, the team Oryx, 20% of the first $25 million plus 17.5% of the next $25 million and 15% of the total guaranteed value exceeding $50 million. And that's going to the organization, not the player. Correct. That's going to the this organization. Is of, this is on top of. Yes. But it, and so I'm you're going to add- that money doesn't count towards the say, uh, luxury tax, right? Correct. Okay. So the question you're going to ask now is, is he worth it? He's only 25 years old. And that's, that is surprisingly young to be able to come out and, and, and come stateside. And he has won the pitching triple crown, uh, lowest DRA, most strikeouts, most win in Japan for each of the past two seasons. He won the LG Samuara Award the last three seasons, which is their equivalent to the Cy Young. Uh, on the Oryx this year, he went 16-6 and six in 23 starts with a 121 ERA. His fastball, Dustin, mid to high 90s with a wipeout split finger fastball and a plus curveball as part of his five pitch mix. Are you enticed yet? Yeah, those numbers are really good. So here's the thing is that Bowden has the Mets, Yankees, Dodgers, Phillies, Rangers, Cardinals, Giants, and the Red Sox, along with the Cubs in on Yamamoto. Bowden predicts a seven year, $211 million contract. If you're doing the math, people, that comes out to roughly thirty million dollars a year. Where, 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 where do you now? Uh, well, I, just I, say, I, I think you could take the Philly. The Phillies are not going to be on in on this, so okay. I think Bowden made that speculation ahead of their sign. Mm-hmm. Um, the Dodgers, you never know, but they're 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 rumored to be making a trade with the White Sox for Dylan Cease. So okay. if they were to do that maybe they don't need to do that. I can't mm-hmm. see the Cardinals spending that kind of money. Um, will the Rangers spend that kind of money? Uh, yeah, you know, it, it screams like Mets Yankees to me, right? I think the Giants, though, are kind of desperate to do something. Right. So, now, and, and now the Red Sox are probably back. You know, they 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 seem to take a couple years off and now they're going to get back into cranking out the checkbook. Now, one thing to kind of keep in mind here is is that Yamamoto's 5'10, 175 pounds. So he's not like these giant beasts that you see. I, I saw Araldus right. Chapman this week. So he's kind of he's he, he's a little bit bigger than Strom. Right. And so the thing you worry about is is that they don't pitch as much in Japan. They don't play throw as many innings in Japan as they do in the United States. Right. And so if you, I, I'm, I'm going to be very curious because Kodai Senga, who had a pretty darn good season with the Mets, they didn't pitch him every fifth day. They gave him a lot of breaks, a lot of pauses, a lot of, you know, those type of things. And that may be the model to kind of work on because it's just, like I said, it's, you don't play as many games. You don't throw as many innings. You don't have to do all the traveling that you do here. Uh, in addition to it being a new country and living up to a huge contract. So just something right. to keep in the back right. of the head. I don't even want to do the math, but if you got to pay him 211 million based on all that other, all those other numbers you shared, you're, you're North of 250 million all in on this guy. Yes. That's what it's looking like. So the other option then so is would what- you rather spend, okay, really quick. Would you rather spend 211 million on Cody Bellinger or this guy? That's a, that's going to be a phenomenal question. <laughs> that it's it's and there's that people, sounds about the number that Cody Bellinger is going to get, right? And there's a lot of people very concerned about Bellinger as well. They have certain things that they're concerned about, but um, I, I I don't know right now. This I mean that is I would love a guy that can throw mid to high nineties with a split finger and a plus curve. Yeah. I mean that I mean that just makes me drool right there. But sounds you awesome. know. Yeah, worry, you, you know, how he handles. I don't worry about him handling MLB pitching or hitters. I worry about, like I said, the wear and tear on his body. So that's my concern. Right. Um, next up, though, is 31 year old lefty Blake Snell, who just won the Cy Young Award, went 14 and nine last year with a 225 ERA, 234 strikeouts, Dustin, over 32 starts. He didn't allow a run in five of the last six starts. 
remember San Diego went on that big charge at the end. They finished just right behind the Cubs. Um, opposing, opposing batters have hit just .079 against his curveball and .185 against his changeup and .123 against his slider. Now, the thing about him, and Bowden points this out in the article, is that you know some teams are a little hesitant because he's pitched 180 innings only twice in his eight-year career and pitched fewer than 130 innings in the other six seasons. Now, Bowden does not have the Cubs in on him. He's predicting five years, $122 million for Snell. Yeah, I don't, I, I, I hope Bowden's right. I don't, I don't, I mean, I want the Cubs to buy everything, right? But because it's not my money, but I, I don't like that idea. I, right. I, I'd rather, I'd rather take a shot at the young Japanese pitcher over this guy. Now, I know yeah. you're talking another, it's basically another hundred million dollars or, you know, 90 million based on the estimates, but, um, I would go that way again. I think, you know, Snell might be good for that team that thinks their, their window is shutting. The Cubs is just opening. Right. Right. And I don't see Blake Snell being the uh, John Lester as an example. Right. I don't, I don't think that's, that's uh, apples to apples comparison. And, you know, the other thing to kind of think about, and we talked about this before on the podcast with, um, when we talked about uh, Shohei is the amount of revenue. Yes, you're spending, but how much is he going to bring in? If you bring Blake Snell to the Cubs, Cub fans are going to be excited and all in. But if you bring in Yamamoto, you're bringing in baseball fans, you're bringing in the Japanese market, th- those type of things. You know, how much is that worth? Is the and is there, market? you know, who knows? I mean, does anybody have any idea? I know we're not specifically talking about him today, but any baseball conversation, I mean, is there a relationship there? Not sure. Right. I mean, is there any kind of recruiting? Could they be a package deal? You know, that, that's what I'm always curious about, but then that you could go the same way with the Mets, right? Like, are they buddies when they play internationally? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I'm sure that these guys all know each other as far as Kodai. I just Sanga don't know. Yeah. And, I just don't and, know. And, I just uh, don't know who, Suzuki. Right, and who's buddies with who, who's buddies with who. Right. We'll see. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully I haven't heard, you know, say nothing from say, but let's see what happens. Uh, another 31-year-old left-hander, Dustin, is is Jordan Montgomery. He had a record of 10 and 11 with a 320 ERA. He started the season with the Cardinals, and you remember there's all that drama about nobody liking to pitch to uh, Wilson Contreras. Right. But when he was traded to Texas, he went four and two with a 2.79 ERA and 11 starts, and one of, was one of the key pitchers in the Rangers World Series winning postseason run. Uh, he was phenomenal in the ALCS. For the season, opposing pitters, hitters hit 239 against his changeup and 191 against his curveball. He's 38 and 34 over his career with a 368 ERA, Dustin. 31 years old, and, and I don't know if they think he's going to continue to improve under the pitching infrastructure. Again, Bowden does not have the Cubs in on him, and they're predicting five years, $127 million for Montgomery, more money than what they think Blake Snell is going to get. Right. So I have the same answer. My answer is the same. Somebody that's a little bit closer who believes their window is shrinking, knock yourselves out. Not, not, I'm not there yet for the Cubs. Another, a guy that has rebounded his career is 34 year old Sonny Gray, right? And he's bounced around a few teams. He's played the last couple of seasons in Minnesota. He, the righty went eight and eight with the 279 ERA starting 32 games. Dustin, he struck out 183 batters in 184 innings. And I guess when I look at some of these guys, that's what I'm looking at is swing and miss stuff. I, I don't, I'm kind of, you know, I, I love our defense. Yeah, you're the done Cubs. with the soft contact thing. Right. I, I it, no, I'm not done with it, but it's but a like, little mix, we, right? We, the right. whole staff doesn't have to have uh, soft contact. Right. I need a guy that, that is going to miss bats and that plays in, 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 in postseason baseball. Yep. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, for me, you know, opposing batters hit just 0.097 against his sweeper. And that's a new pitch that he added to his repertoire. And it's the one that the Cubs love. They've been teaching all their uh, pitchers, this sweeper and stuff like that. So, you know, he, the, um, Bowden has him as three years, $64 million contract. Uh, you know, so th- very similar to what Marcus Stroman would have made this right. year. Right. So just a name, you know, those are kind of the big names. When you take a look now, when you talk about obviously Yamamoto, Blake Snell, Montgomery and gray, there's well, a gray, couple- you know, yeah. Gray. I mean, gray used to be in the division, right. At one point. 
Yeah, yeah. And he was with the Reds. Right. So he knows the division a little bit. I mean, it, it, it doesn't like – I mean, I don't think people are going to run and buy season tickets or anything because they signed Sonny Gray, but it, it would be okay. He's also not breaking the bank. No. Now, some other names that are out there, and, and um, you know, this is very similar to, uh, you know, with Brandon Woodruff, just another guy I don't think is going to be there, but it was a shocking non-tender by Milwaukee. That was the biggest name out there, right? Yeah, that was the and biggest it might show you it might show you what, what they're thinking. And so with Woodruff, he's out for next year. So basically, mm-hmm. you're going to give him a two-year deal, but you're only going to get one year out of it, so that's going to right. affect the price point. Mm-hmm. Marcus Stroman still out there. You could still re-sign him if you wanted. Uh, that would be probably, but again, another multi-year deal. And I think it's been established. Any rumors on who might be kicking the tires on him? Nothing yet that I've heard. Okay. Okay. Michael Walk is another name, uh, former Cardinal. Again, I don't know where you're at on that. Um, doesn't do much for me, I guess. The less but, Cardinal is the better up here, in my opinion. And, but there's two names that are former White Sox, and I'm gonna—I I know what one of your—I know what both your answers are gonna be, but I'm still gonna throw them out there. Lucas Giolito has struggled over the last couple of years. Um, you know, they, there was thought that he was going to be something great. Do you take a flyer on Lucas Giolito, the other guy that had some really good seasons before he got injured, a guy who went through a lot of drama at the South Side at the beginning of the year? I think I think the score was involved in some of that too. Uh, Mike Clevenger, not on the Molly and Haw show anyway. Um, nope. <laughs> uh, Lucas Giolito, um, one year, 12 million prove it deal. I, I'd be down with that. I could, he's 29 I could, too, you know, so I he's could, another, I could, he, I, yeah, I could stomach that. 30. Right. I could stomach that Clevenger. No, thanks. Yeah. So even Clevenger, though again, they major league baseball investigated, he said, she said, I wasn't there. I don't know. I'll just take a pass. Yeah, he's also so Giolito's 29, Clevenger's 33. So Giolito to me is the youngest of the bunch. Um, Udias would have been 27. Uh, and then like I like it's Tyler Molly 20, 29. But yeah, a lot of these guys, you know, just don't really pop out and they're definitely not front of the line starters. I don't think anyone wants to go back to Zach Davies or uh, you know, some of these other guys on the yeah, list that you just no. like. But Giolito, nah. I think that could be interesting. I mean, the guy, let's put it this way, the guy's a workhorse. Okay. And if you could and he's got he's if he's got something to prove, I think he's a competitor. I think he's a good person. Cubs seem to like their culture right now. So I, I wouldn't be totally opposed to that if that uh, surprises you a little bit. Interesting. All right. I, I, that does surprise me. And so, you know, they're, they're, out of those guys, I think we there's a clear number one in Yamamoto. And then everybody else to me is kind of like a... But I think, you know, Crawley, the thing with Yamamoto, and I know we're not talking hitters yet, but if you go Yamamoto, what's the rest of it look like, right? I mean, that's right. kind of... Because I think every... it go it, You know, it takes like a drastic... You know, if you go Yamamoto, does that mean Pat Wisdom's your DH slash first baseman? Is that what that says? Well, if you added his contract, let's say thirty million, and that would put you at what close to two hundred. Right. You still have thirty-seven million, roughly, to pay, play with, and that doesn't mean you can't go over. No, it doesn't for mean you first, can't go for, over. You know, if you got to, you, know. you basically still got to build a bullpen. Okay, so let's just say ten million on the bullpen, maybe. Right. Yeah, that seems kind of high. Okay. I don't know. Maybe not. Um, well, we'll get there. We'll get there. That's okay. It, it's a fun, you know, this is where we get to armchair quarterback, if you will. Right. We get to armchair GM who doesn't, who doesn't like fantasy sports, right? If I was in charge, if it was my, if it was my checking account to write checks out of spending the Ricketts money, what would I do? Who right. doesn't like and, that? And, and again, you know, there's so much to think about and, 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 uh, to me, it's just, like I said, I'm glad to hear the Cubs in the conversation for big, uh, ticket players. That's the only thing I'm happy about. And, and, and hopefully, you know, one, at least two big ticket items is what's on Jed's uh, Thanksgiving list. You are listening to the fly, the W six seventy podcast. It's season two. It's episode 89 Cubs free agent pitching options for 2024. Don't forget to listen, download, review, subscribe to the fly, the W podcast. And of course we hope you guys out there all have a wonderful Thanksgiving, a lot to be thankful for. And besides the uh, free agents, another way the Cubs can acquire talent, they can call up prospects, they can trade, they can uh, do all kinds of things. And in this segment, Crawley's interviewing Kyle Glasser, Baseball America, to talk about the recent 10 Cubs prospect list. Joining me now on the Fly the W podcast, I'm happy to have on Kyle Glazer. He is your senior writer at Baseball America. Kyle, how are you doing tonight? 
Doing all right. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I was really excited the other day when, you know, some of us prospect geeks, when when all of a sudden that comes out and you got the list, you know, where's our guys? You know, we've had a lot of guys here on the Fly the W podcast who've come on and it's hard sometimes when you get to meet these guys and know them and you're always just rooting for them. But uh, looking at your list, I mean, it, it's hard to disagree with any of the choices that you have on the top 10. That's for sure. <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's the culmination of, of, I would say, a year long process, but really it's years long. We've been tracking these guys since they were drafted or first signed on the international market. We've been watching them every step of the way. I've done the Cubs prospect handbook chapter for us at Baseball America for I want to say four years now. So in a lot of ways, I've seen a lot of these guys come up from rookie ball all the way now to some of them are in triple A. So it's been cool to see the progression, see how the new talent has come in and provided an influx, uh, see how the traded prospects or the guys I should say that were acquired in trades have come in. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a whole years long effort of watching these guys, studying these guys, talking to scouts about these guys this year, last year, the year before, and building really a holistic view of who these guys are as players. And, 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 you know, when you look at this, it, it seems, I remember when all the core just got traded, just like boom, boom, boom. Obviously it started with you Darvish, but then all of a sudden, you know, at the trade deadline, we remember Bryant Rizzo and Javier Baez all gone. And it was like a gut punch, but out of the ashes of all of that, it seems like Jed and, and, and whether you're talking about Dan Kantrovitz, whether you're talking about, you know, so many people, Justin Stone, uh, Craig Breslow, who just went to Boston, all that stuff. It just seems like they've built a, a, a very strong infrastructure of talent in a short amount of time. Yeah, that's what's really stood out about the Cubs is they reloaded this farm system pretty quickly. Typically, when you have a tear it down to the studs rebuild like we saw in 2021, Darvish technically was still in calendar year 2020. It was right after Christmas, uh, but everyone else got traded in 2021 around the deadline. You typically need about four years minimum to get back to having a playoff caliber team in the major leagues just because to backfill all that talent, you know, it takes time for those guys to matriculate up the farm system. It takes time for guys to make their way up from being international signees and not all of them hit. So if you have 10 good prospects, realistically, if even four of them become major leaguer, that's a really good success rate. And for the Cubs to reload as quickly as they have has been really, really impressive. Obviously, they had a winning record in the majors this year. We saw some homegrown guys really take steps forward. Justin Steele, most notably, but you know, we saw Nico Horner had a really good year. We saw Christopher Morrell take a step forward. So we're seeing homegrown guys take steps forward and keep getting better in the majors. And really what stood out about this system is almost all of their top guys took steps forward this past year. And you might say, well, duh, but... That's pretty rare. Normally, if you have, say, 10 prospects in a system you think are top 10, year over year, maybe four or five will take steps forward, two or three will get hurt, and two or three will take steps backward and not be as good as you thought. Really look at the Cubs farm system. Almost all of their key guys got better this year. That's a testament to the coaching staff. It's a testament to the player development staff, the front office, the scouting group for getting the right guys and then helping develop them the right way. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing that's been interesting is, is I know it, you know, it, it's, it's different in the minors than in the majors, but seeing the teams have a lot of postseason success at all levels of the Cubs organizational system, especially the guys that have, you know, won last year with South Bend. And now this year they were, you know, a lot of them were at the Tennessee Smokies. Yeah. They, they, they broke, broke their drought out of there. It, it just, you know, I know it's not all about postseason. It's more about development, but watching, the affiliates succeed as much as they have has been really fun as well. Yeah. That double a Tennessee team by the end of the year, when all the guys got called up and that roster, they were fielding in the postseason. That was one of the more talented single lineups in the minor leagues. You add in some of the pitchers on that staff led of course by Cade Horton. But, you know, we talk so much about the minor leagues development over winning, but a lot of times they go hand in hand. And uh, one of our former interns, Justin Perline, who now actually works for the Pittsburgh Pirates, did a study on this where he showed that winning at the upper levels, double A AA and triple A, does have a positive correlation to success in the major leagues. And when you see a team, and a lot of those guys were pretty young too, you know, Owen Casey, Kevin Alcantara, that double A team. You know, Matt Shaw was a college guy, but he'd just been drafted a few months earlier. <laughs> For these guys who are this young or have this little experience to have this much success in the upper levels, and this was a dominant finish. That Tennessee team went undefeated in the postseason. They ran rough shot through it. It's really, really encouraging, and, and there is something to be taken from that in terms of what's to come at Wrigley Field and how likely these kids are to be successful in the major leagues. Okay, so 
I, I have stalled long enough. People are probably wondering, well, you, okay, get to the list. Quit talking, Crawley. Um, you know, at number 10, you have Jackson Ferris, right? Left-handed pitcher, um, you know, from IMG Academy. Yeah, so Jackson Ferris was one of the top draft picks in the 2022 draft. I should say one of the top prep pitchers in the 2022 draft class. The Cubs got him in the second round, gave him an above slot deal, and he's always had really, really good stuff. You're talking mid-90s to the left side, hammer curveball. The big thing with him is just ironing out the control. His delivery has just some contorting aspects to it. It's not the cleanest arm action or delivery out there. So there's been some questions about the strike throwing. Uh, just went out to low A Myrtle Beach this year. There's a lot of shorter outings. Didn't get a huge workload, but showed really, really wicked stuff when he was out there. and showed the ability to throw it over the plate enough that he's just dominant. This is not a guy who's ever going to be a pinpoint command guy, but his stuff's so good. If he puts it over the plate, he's going to get a lot of hitters out. The big thing with him is just that consistency. Again, I don't think you're ever going to see a guy who's even an average control guy. But you know, one comparison point that an evaluator made was they hope he can one day be like Blake Snell. Now, obviously, that's very, very lofty comparing him to a two-time Cy Young Award winner. <laughs> but the idea being that, look, he's going to frustrate you with some walks. It's never going to be, oh, here's you know nine innings and 99 pitches. There's going to be some times where it's five innings and 100 pitches, six innings and 100 pitches. But... The stuff's so good that when it's over the plate, guys don't hit them. And if that's the outcome, that's a huge win for the Cubs. Obviously, we're not going there yet. We're not going to compare him to a two-time Sang Award winner. But just the idea of, again, great stuff, control's a little wonky, but if he throws enough strikes, he has a chance to be really, really good. Uh, and and, and I, I, got, I was lucky enough I had a chance to go to Myrtle Beach this year. And, and there was a couple of names that I wrote down when I was scribbling them and a couple of them got promoted right after I left, but that's number nine. You got Jefferson Rojas. That was a guy that I was just looking at and I was like, wasn't a guy that right away jumped, you know, I had heard about him, but I had never seen him play. And, and it's just different in person. You know what I mean? When you, when you see a guy like that and, and, and as a shortstop, it looks, you know, when you talk about infielders, you know, when you play shortstop, you can play a lot of different infield spots. This kid was really impressive to me. Yeah, he really jumped out right away and extended spring training out in Arizona. You know, he was someone who was not a top, top international dude. I mean, he was known. He got some money. He wasn't a $10,000 signee. He was nobody, but he wasn't a top, top guy. And he surprised even the Cubs with just how good he was. And it really started when he was in Arizona. He hit a bomb off of Zach Davies, a rehabbing big leaguer. And here's this kid in a stateside debut, teenager. And just really, really made a lot of noise out there. That's why he was promoted so quickly out of the ACL is you just see, oh, the one or two ACL games and he gets promoted. But really, it was everything he had done before that during extended spring training and minor league spring training. And for someone that young to hold his own in Myrtle Beach, which is one of the most pitcher-friendly parks in the country, it was just super impressive. Again, the, the slash line is not going to jump out at you, but when you take the context into account of an 18-year-old in Myrtle Beach, it was a really impressive season. And as you said, he can play shortstop. There's no doubt about that. So at the end of the day, we have to see how the bat develops. We're talking about kids this young, at especially the young, the lower levels only. There's so, so, so many things that have to click for them to get from that point to hitting big league pitching. But you certainly see the outlines of a potential power hitting shortstop who can really play defense. And that's an exciting young player. He's someone that definitely at this time next year could be much higher on this list. Oh, man. Now, at number eight, you got Ben Brown. He's appeared on the podcast. I mean, such a great kid. And, and you know, it looked to me like he was just on the verge of coming up in September before injuries kind of shut him down. I was just impressed. I know that there were some issues with the ball as far as the difference in the baseball between double A and triple A. And he just seemed to keep rolling no matter what they threw at him. Yeah. I mean, the big thing with Ben Brown has always been injuries. Uh, you know, he had his appendix burst in high school. That's partially why he went so low in the draft. He's had some elbow stuff. And, you know, this year he actually was on the verge of getting called up uh, in July and then he got hurt. And the Cubs called up Jordan Wicks instead. Ben Brown was actually in line to get the call up. And then he went down. I, I spoke to Cubs officials about that. So the big thing with him is just staying healthy. After he came back from his injury, they put him in the bullpen. It's interesting, depending on who you talk to, whether or not he projects better in the rotation or the bullpen. There's no doubt about the stuff. You see the body and the physicality. He's just got to stay healthy. There is some sense that put him in the bullpen, let him blow it out because – Throwing 150, 180, 200 innings 
it's hard to say he can do that when he's never done it. But they're going to give him every chance to start. He'll open back in Iowa's rotation next year, and he should help the Cubs in some form or fashion. It's really just going to come down to if he can stay healthy. Now, at number seven is a guy that, I mean, Kevin Alcantara is a guy that, to me, just has that it factor. I mean, he looks like a star. And the one comp I keep making is is to Alfonso Soriano as far as just kind of like, just kind of electric, very wiry build, that kind of stuff. And, 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 and he just has a confidence to him, you know, and, and, and I remember they asked him at Cubs convention, they had all the prospects up about, you know, having to take, you know, with PCA and Alcantara that someone asked what it was like having to replace, you know, Rizzo and Baez and both guys just seemed a hundred percent confident in their ability. And like I said, some about watching Kevin run the bases and just when he's at bat, it's just kind of like, you just kind of pay attention to him, you know? Yeah, so this was the part of the Cubs list where things got a little bit, I want to say murky, but there were no clear delineations really between four and seven. You could put any of those guys up to four. So if you wanted to say Kevin Alcantara is the number four prospect as opposed to number seven prospect in the Cubs system, you're not going to hear a huge argument from me. You can absolutely make that case. In terms of what Kevin Alcantara can do, look, he's 6'6", super skinny. He looks like really he should be a high school basketball player. I mean, that's the build we're talking about here. And the big thing with him is just, you know, the long levers, the long body. He tends to start slowly. Um, You know, spin recognition is still an issue, being a little overly aggressive. And and it takes him a while to get his swing in sync and his long limbs just kind of all where they need to be. We've seen him start really slow two years in a row now and just not look great. But he figures it out. He makes adjustments. And that's important to see. That's a huge part of success in this game is – making those adjustments physically, mentally, and getting better as the year goes on. And he's shown that ability two years in a row now to go from not looking great at all early in the season to really, really becoming a force by the end of it. You see the power. He moves well. I think what's really impressive is you see him at 6'6 and say he's going to fill out, get too big, and have to move to a corner. But he can really play center field. I mean, that's what's really impressive for a guy that big to move like he does and play center field like he does. He's really, really impressive. Now, again, if he fills out and puts on 30 or 40 pounds, we might have to have a different conversation. But it's kind of that skinnier build. And then all of a sudden it's, hey, this can be a real center fielder, which puts less pressure on the bat. The biggest thing with him is just going to be continuing to improve that pitch recognition, chase out of the zone a little bit less. We've seen him be able to do it as seasons have gone on. Now the next step is showing he can make that adjustment before the season and be more consistently good from start to finish. Yeah. And, you know, talking to a couple of the guys at South Bend, you know, my Brendan King, or the, one of the announcers, Brendan King, you know, he was saying it was so cold in April, you know, a guy coming in and having to go to South Bend and playing around the Great Lakes that once he, once it warmed up, he warmed up as well. Uh, next on your list at number six is, is Jordan Wicks. We got to see him in the bigs, got to see him at Wrigley, um, 2021 first round draft pick. And, and, you know, he looked pretty solid, you know, to, to be, you know, being thrown in the middle of a pennant chase. Yeah, and that's the thing with him. You know, he's solid. He's poised. He, he's going to give you solid outings most of the time out. You know, we saw him get off to a really hot start after league adjusted to him a little bit. His last few starts, he got hit around a little bit. It's not big stuff. You know, everything is fine. Um, the changeup is is his out pitch. You're kind of hoping for like a Marco Gonzalez type here, where you're looking at kind of that you know, probably number four-ish starter who just mixes and matches and locates, and he has that changeup that he can turn to for an out pitch. And and look, those guys are valuable. You need good number four starters to get to a World Series and win a World Series. You know, is there more in there in terms of ceiling? It's hard to say that, um, but again, for him to get to the majors as fast as he did, and and he showed you what he's capable of. He can hold down some good lineups, have some good outings. There are going to be days where, you know, his command isn't precise. And when that happens, he's going to get hit because he doesn't really have the pure stuff to get away with it. But you talk about a poised, mature, um, experienced pitcher who who knows how to mix his stuff and locate and keep batters off balance. He can do all that and, and be an effective back the rotation starter. And he's ready to do that right now. Now for number five, this is a guy I told you, I wrote down three names when I was down in Myrtle Beach. I wrote down, uh, you know, Jefferson Rojas, and number five is Moises Ballesteros. And and my other guy was Michael Arias, who's not on the list yet, yet. But Ballesteros, just watching him, you know, 
for such a young guy, he displayed like just a maturity on the field. I'm like, man, this guy is like, you know, looks like the captain, you know, just kind of barking out there. And then he gets up, you know, he's one of those guys, the reinforcements that were called up to Tennessee and he's playing first base. And, you know, for, for a team that's been struggling, looking for a first baseman since Anthony Rizzo, it's just something that you say, okay, where, where, where do you see, where do you see Moises at? Do you see him catching or, or maybe moving to first? Yeah, so the issue with Moises Ballesteros, and you're right, he's a very, very advanced hitter. It's mature at bats. It's just all around. Everything he does in the box is is well beyond his years. He can certainly hit. He can work a good at bat. He can do a lot of good things. There's power in there. Uh, he's just a very, very, very big boy, and that limits his mobility a lot behind the plate. So you see hands. You actually see some surprising flexibility for a guy his size behind the play. When I say you see hands, you see strong hands. He still boxes some balls and drops them and needs to work on his receiving. I think it really is just going to come down to him and how his body changes. Um, you know, as one Cubs official put it, just bluntly, he's 20 pounds away from being a good catcher. And if he's able to drop the weight or streamline it even a little bit, he's going to have a shot to stay behind the plate. If he keeps getting bigger as he gets older, which we do see happen a lot, it's going to be tough. And in terms of first base, you know, he's about five foot eight and there's not many five foot eight first basemen out there. That would be really, really challenging for him. So it really, in a lot of ways is probably more catcher or bust where, where he has to end up, you know, maybe DHing. Again, we've seen a proliferation of shorter first basemen a little bit. You look at, um, you know, Owen Miller, Miller, when he was in Milwaukee, Ty France is about five ten Seattle. So, you, you do see it, but it's not ideal. I think the best case scenario is he drops the weight and is able to remain a catcher. Otherwise, it might end up being more of a DH situation. Hmm. At number four, you had Owen Cassie. And, and, and I feel like with Owen, you know, the last of the U Darvish trade guys that, you know, we, 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 you know, we talked about earlier, I, I really felt that the World Baseball Classic kind of really opened a lot of people's eyes. And, and again, another young guy, younger guy, you know, just doing amazing things and, and coming up and, you know, what he did with South Bend last year and what he did with Tennessee this year. It just, the guy just wins. Yeah. So, I mean, Owen Casey, you mentioned the World Baseball Classic. I covered that for us, Baseball America, start to finish. And, you know, you saw the power that was always in there. What was actually most impressive to me was how much he's improved defensively. You know, this kid grew up in Canada, cold weather, didn't play a lot of outdoor baseball. And this was a kid who could hit. He did a lot of good work in the cages, had good coaching, did well in the junior national team. But, there were times out there he looked really rough in the outfield. I mean, high fly balls. He he didn't know how to catch them, and it just was a you know a situation where he needed time and reps. And we saw him get significantly better to the point where now he's actually playing a pretty good right field. So you just see a young kid who works hard, who gets better, who keeps finding ways to adjust and adapt to the level of competition. He was 20 years old this year at Double A. I think what was really encouraging is we saw once the Southern League went back to the regular baseballs and got rid of the uh, the sticky ball, his strikeouts went way down. And they improved over the course of the year. There's still always going to be some swing and a miss there. Look, he's just a bigger, longer levered guy. And his bat speed's not like electric. Like there's some times where things can get a little slow just because he's so big and long. But when he's on time and when he connects – that ball goes a very, very long way, and it is very, very loud contact. So there's real, real middle-of-the-order type power in there from the left side. He keeps getting better defensively. There's a lot of things to like about Owen Casey. The, the thing to watch with him is just going to be, again, making sure he stays quick enough and short enough because sometimes he can kind of get long and slow just the way his body works. Now, your, your number three one, really, you know, this is a guy that Cubs fans are super eager to see. And I hear people already because, you know, Cubs are obviously in need of a third baseman. Oh, don't worry. Matt Shaw will be up in by mid-year. I'm just going uh, to pump the brakes. But but Matt Shaw has made a lot of people excited. Another one of the Tennessee call-ups later on. And, and like you said, drafted college player, but just moved right through everything like it was nothing. Yeah, he was really, really impressive in his pro debut, getting up to double A, hitting prolifically. He's a good hitter. Now, he's a little bit aggressive. There's going to be some tight, tightening of the strike zone needed, but, I mean, he does not miss a pitch over the plate. He hits for impact. There's some power in there. He's a guy that has a chance to hit, be an effective top half of the order type. Again, is it more of a number two hitter than a cleanup hitter? Probably, but 
He can hit for average. He can hit for power. It's just a really good ball player who's aggressive, plays hard, um, does, does a lot of things well. In terms of defense, he's spent some time at shortstop. He can stand there if you need. Second base is actually probably his more natural position in terms of the next position to move off. But with Nico Horner there, third base is kind of the opening. And he's a good enough athlete with good enough hands and good enough defensive instincts that with reps and experience, he should be able to handle it. Uh, he's a really good player. And, and as I was putting the list together, talking to evaluators both inside and outside the system, uh, getting my own looks, looking at some of the data. At first coming in, I thought there was a clear top two, and then it was a little bit of a jumble. As the reporting unfolded, it was actually pretty clear that Matt Shaw was pretty clearly the number three, kind of atop the next group. Just everything he can do, how talented of a hitter he is. And you add the athlete, you add the scrappiness and the mentality. You have a good feeling he's going to get the most from his ability. Do you think that, that he, they may actually start him at third this year in Tennessee? It's going to depend a little bit on what the rest of that roster looks like. Again, who gets moved up. Um, but at the end of the day, he's the priority prospect. So he's probably going to go wherever the Cubs want him to go. I, I do think that we will see him get time at third this year, um, whether he's there every day versus moving around a little bit. That's TBD. All righty. Number two, I remember this draft pick was a little controversial at the time in 2022. There was a lot of hitters in that draft and the Cubs went with Cade Horton and now, and everybody's happy with that pick now. <laughs> yeah. Cade Horton had one of the best years of, of any pitcher in the minor leagues. I think one of the things I remember getting a lot of angry chat questions from Cubs fans thinking that Cade Horton was the next Hayden Simpson. And I feel like we need to take a step back. Cade Horton was a top two rounds talent out of high school. He just had a really strong commitment to Oklahoma. He arrived there, he had Tommy John surgery. And once he, and he was also a quarterback, he's a great athlete. You know, had TJ, and it took him a little while to find his form. But once he did, the further he moved away from surgery, he was one of the best pitchers in college baseball at the end of last year. So the talent was always prodigious. It was just he got hurt. And I think the Cubs certainly took a little bit of a gamble in the sense anytime you're picking in the top 10 and you take a guy coming off of surgery, and while he looked great, it was a small sample. Uh, but they look very, very smart for what they did there. He was dominant this year. I think what was most encouraging is you knew the fastball and slider were really good pitches. The curveball and changeup progressed really, really rapidly. And instead of being a guy with two plus pitches and two that were maybe lagging behind and need development, now you've got two plus pitch, two plus pitches, excuse me, uh, two more pitches that are probably above average at this point. And the control's been really good too. All he needs to do is building dur is build durability against one thing to hold four above average or better pitches and above average commander better for 88 innings versus 160 innings. Um, but he absolutely trended in the right way and kind of took the step you wanted to see him take another year removed from surgery. Not only that, because of, you know, what, the, what they were that when they signed him and what they paid him, they were able to turn around and give Jackson Ferris a little bit of money, more extra money. So that looks like a two for one, you know? Yeah. Now in, in fairness, historically trying to do that in the top 10 actually rarely works out. A lot of times you, you end up taking just a lesser player in the top 10 and the high school overpay doesn't always work out very well because that's a really risky demographic. I will say the Cubs did a good job and identifying that Cade Horton was a top 10 talent who could just be had for less because of the injury and the concerns about, okay, yes, he looked great in the college world series. I don't know how sustainable it is. So, um, it can work. It, it often doesn't, but, and look, at the end of the day, what happens in the major leagues with these two guys is what will determine whether it worked or not, not what they do in double A and low A respectively. But in terms of the year one return, it certainly looks promising. And, and finally, number one, no shock to anybody that's been paying attention to Cubs baseball, Pete Crow Armstrong. He got a little taste of the majors. And it's funny because people were just so down a little bit that, you know, they were expecting him to be, you know, uh, the next coming of Ricky Henderson is very, you know, in the middle of a pennant race and he only got to bat really like one time a game. Uh, but, but I, I'm, I just keep telling people do not give up on this kid. I've, I've gotten to see him in a, in a couple of different places in the minors. I got to see him in triple A, got to see him in uh high A. I mean, he is just something else. Yeah. I think giving up on a guy who's 21 <laughs> after 19 plate appearances in the majors is, uh, beyond premature and kind of ridiculous <laughs> look he's a really talented kid first of all he's a perennial gold glove type defender out there in center field 
He can run down balls in any direction. He can make an impact on the base pass. And he's continued. He's always been a good contact hitter. We've seen him get stronger, start to impact the baseball more, really at every level. It's a really good player. A, a very common comparison for him is Jacoby Ellsbury with more power than Ellsbury's typical year. Now he's not going to get Jacoby Ellsbury's 33 home run season, but we, you know, we saw Ellsbury kind of sit in that nine home run range, except for that one year. I think PCA will be more like the 12 to 15 range, but look, Jacoby Ellsbury was a starting center fielder and leadoff hitter for, you know, world series winning teams and, and a really, really good player made some all-star games, won a gold glove, got a giant contract that's what Pete Crow Armstrong can be, uh, a top of the order, one-two hitter who wins gold gloves and really sets the tone atop the order. What he can do defensively is special, but don't underestimate. The kid can hit, too. Again, his first 19 plate appearances in his major league debut is not a barometer of what he can or can't do. <laughs> yeah, and Jed Hoyer kind of was talking about how Rizzo struggled with the Padres in roughly about the same amount of bats, and then all of a sudden, you know, he became – you know, the guy that really was the face of the organization for the 2000s. So, you know, I, I, I just think that when you take a look at your list, at where the Cubs farm system ranked, the future looks bright. And and it's fun that both, you know, things are happening both at the major league letter level and the minor league level. And I think Cub fans have a lot to look forward to. Yeah, I mean, that's what really stands out is the progress we saw from guys in the major leagues this year combined with how many guys took big positive steps forward in the minor leagues. The Cubs outlook looks pretty good right now. Again, these guys have to stay healthy. They have to continue their gains. There's a lot of things that have to happen, but you certainly look at where the Cubs are as a franchise right now. And the more you look, the more optimistic you can get that this team is going to turn it around here pretty quickly. Obviously hiring Craig council was a, a big, big move. Um, there's a lot to like here. I think the Cubs are in a really good place as an organization, not just a farm system, but as an organization. I fully expect them to be contending for a playoff spot, certainly by 2025, if not 2024. That sounds great. Um, Kyle, can you do me a favor and let our listeners know where they can follow you on social media and where they can read your work? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Baseball America. Obviously, you can go ahead and subscribe to the magazine. We still put it out. It's a great product. Uh, you can also find me at BaseballAmerica.com. And I'm on, I'm going to call it Twitter, not X. I'm on Twitter uh, at Kyle A. Glazer. Love it. Um, I'm always going to call it Twitter no matter what, just like we call it the Sears Tower. So Kyle, I appreciate you jumping on and, and, and thank you so much. And hopefully I will see you maybe at one of the minor league ballparks. Yeah, absolutely. Look forward to seeing you. You are listening to episode 89, season two of the Fly the W670 podcast. Happy Thanksgiving to you and yours. We are going to talk about the Cubs free agent pitching options all in this episode, plus all throughout the offseason. Don't forget to download, review, subscribe to the Fly the W podcast. And if you're like Crowley, you're going through the, me, uh, the baseball shakes. And in this new segment, we are going to tell you how to help fill your social calendar and to see Crowley. You know, Crowley's at all these events. Uh, <laughs> on Tuesday, the Cubs Win Trust Winterland begins. Shana Banuska, the assistant director of marketing at Marquee Development, will tell Cub fans and Crowley what they can expect in this magical winter wonderland. Joining me now on the Fly the W podcast, she is the Assistant Director of Marketing at Marquee Development, Shana Banuska. Shana, how are you today? I'm good. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, I had to have you on because I one of my favorite times of year is coming up. It used to be that when the last game of the season happened, I would just sit there and, and and sulk away from Wrigley. And every now and then I would drive by it and just look out the window. And there, that was it. There was nothing going on. But over the last few years, you guys have turned Wrigley into a winter wonderland that is a lot of fun for both Cub fans and their families. Uh, tell us a little bit about the winter wonderland. Yes. So Wintrust Winterland at Gallagher Way is opening up this Tuesday, November 21st. Like you said, we've been here for a few years, expanding every time. Last year, we took it for the first time into the ballpark. And this year, we're adding even more rides and games than ever before. So really just blowing out the full experience. Yeah. And so for those of you that are subscribed to the 670 The Scores YouTube channel, I have some pictures up here. It's just amazing. You kind of walk into the iconic ballpark and the first time that you guys had it, like you said, inside, this it used to be all outside. And then all of a sudden you opened up the park and I'm like, oh my God, these guys are geniuses. Because 
it is so cool. You walk in, you see the scoreboard, you see the lights, but you're walking on Wrigley and there's rides, there's games. There, there's just a little bit, there's bumper cars. I mean, uh, ice skating, take the kids ice skating. And and you got, and, and if you're looking at this, the scoreboard is right behind my son's in the picture. The scores boards behind him. I mean, I'm thinking about making my Christmas card out of this, this year, this is, this is where I'm at. So um, it, it truly is a fun, magical event. Like you said, they, they have, when you walk in, they just got a lot, the bumper cars, the ice skating, they got carnival games. Um, in the past, you had like the basketball game and you had the um, throwing, it was kind of like carnival games. This year, you got a couple new ones. You got the polar puck shot. So yeah, that's our fun new hockey game. Um, we also have blizzard bags where you can throw the bean bags through the fun baseball shapes and trim the tree, which is kind of like the ladder game, but of course looks like looking like a Christmas tree with ornaments. Um, <laughs> but yeah, tons of new rides and games for everyone to enjoy. It really, we are finding every square foot of Wrigley Field that we can put something to do in. <laughs> Oh yeah. And, and when you, when you look at the games, like I said, the, the kids just love it. They line up, they're throwing basketballs. They were throwing like softballs there. And the cool thing is, is all the lights and decorations. If I, if I have a recommendation for Cub fans, take the family one time during the day and then take the family at night. Cause it's like two different experiences. Yes, absolutely. With the sparkling lights all over Gallagher way and in the ballpark, it truly is a magical experience. Now, one of the things that you guys have are these chalets that people can rent out. And they're really cool. They're, 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 they can be totally stocked, however you're looking at it. Tell us a little bit about the chalets. Yes. So our Maker's Mark chalets are back by popular demand. We've added even more chalets this year. Um, those are perfect for your groups of up to 20 guests. Um, the activities there start at $60 a person, and that includes your seating inside and outside of your chalet for your guests, a warm fireplace, um, a hot chocolate bar and snacks. And you can, of course, plus up your experience with different food and drinks as well. It also comes oh. with five attraction tickets, which you can use to go skate on our Gallagher ice rink. And, and, and it's just really, if you have that chalet, especially like on a, on a cool night, I mean, that's just kind of nice to have that you can kind of go in and out. I took these pictures last year. You guys were smelling, selling packets of graham crackers, chocolate, and marshmallow, and you can literally cook s'mores out there. Yes. I mean, <laughs> um, we will have those again this year. Never fear. Our s'mores okay. kits are super popular, so we've added even more fire pits. We'll have more s'mores kits inside of our lodge, which is the apreski style tent that we have out in the field as well. Now, tell me, is this new this year that I see that the lodge is going to be having live music on Thursday nights beginning on Thursday, November 30th through Thursday, January 4th? Yes, we know that the lodge is where everyone likes to go to warm up. So we've added some entertainment programming inside the lodge. So like you said, we'll have live music. We're also going to be throwing in some trivia and bingo on select nights. Um, and you can obviously grab your drinks and some ballpark fare there as well. Wait, 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 wait. Did you just say bingo? I heard there's going to be bingo. Yes. On select Tuesday nights, I believe we're going to have trivia and bingo. Is Wayne Mesmer going to be involved? You know, I'd have to look into that, but um, <laughs> I'll keep you posted there. <laughs> Just so you know, Cubs convention bingo is like, I've been doing it for close to 24, 25 years. Wayne's never called my numbers, but I live for Wayne, Wayne Mesmer calling bingo. So all I can do is hope, but I'm a bingo junkie anyway. So you had me there. All we need is karaoke and now we're really cooking. But, um, you know, when, when you kind of take a look at this, you have all of this stuff inside, Right. Mm -hmm. um, but can you also tell me what is, you know, the U.S. Virgin Islands Igloo experience? What's going on with that in the bleachers? Yeah, so that is brand new this year. We are super excited to have four igloos up in the Budweiser bleachers. So for the U.S. Virgin Islands Igloo experience, you can have a group of up to six guests. And it comes with a tropical drink and dessert package. And it's like a little island oasis during all of the holiday cheer. Oh, my gosh. You guys are going all out this year. This is absolutely phenomenal. Um, but for those people that are like, ah, oh, you know, you know, it might be expensive, this and that there's also free stuff to do in the area. And that's in Gallagher way. And this is where everything kind of started was, I want to say it was like 2017 or 2018. You put the ice rink outside, um, of Gallagher way. And, and, and I, and I remember watching the, the, how the Grinch stole Christmas, the Dr. Seuss and ice skating right around Wrigley. And it was so much fun. But for, you know, if you want, there's a lot of cool things that you can do. It doesn't require tickets or anything. And, and that's the Chris Kindle market in Wrigleyville. Tell us a little bit about that. 
Yeah, so Gallagher Way activities remain free and open to the public, including the Chris Kindle Market at Wrigleyville. Um, like you mentioned, the skating rink used to be out there. We've moved it into the ballpark to make room for even more Chris Kindle Market vendors. We're, we have more this year than ever before, which we are super excited about. Um, you can get your raclette sandwiches, your glue wine with a special collectible mug, only available at our location this year. Um, and yeah, there's plenty you can do out in Gallagher Way with that, with the shopping and food and drinks. And we also have a new 40-foot Ferris wheel out in Gallagher Way. I saw that. That has to be crazy. And 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 you said that the mug this year is not just like a generic Chris Kindle one. It's one that's unique to Wrigley. Yes. Chris Kindle Market is going all out. There is a special mug for each of their three locations. So you'll have to stop by Wrigleyville to get this one. Wow. This is, this is absolutely amazing. And so... When you kind of take a look at there, there's regular entry tickets that start at $5, free entry for children two and under. Um, but but to me, you know, it, it's better if you buy them before going the day of because it can get crowded. Yes, definitely. Um, we encourage guests to buy their tickets in advance online. You can go to GallagherWay.com where you can get either your Wrigley Field admission, which starts at $5, or we have early bird pricing right now through November 20th, which is Monday. Um, where you can get $30 peppermint packs. And what that is, is your Wrigleyville or your Wrigley Field admission plus 10 attraction tickets, which can be redeemed for all the rides and games that we talked about inside Wrigley Field, as well as ice skating. Wow, that, that, that's great. And so, you know, you said that, when, when does the Chris, when does the, the, the tree get lit up? The tree will be lit during our Wintrust tree lighting ceremony, which is coming up at 5 p.m. on Tuesday, opening day of Winterland. So um, Winterland will be open starting at 11 a.m. that day. So we encourage everyone to come early, experience all of the activities, and then gather with us in Gallagher Way to light the tree. Wow. And, and then the regular hours will start uh, soon. It'll be Monday through Thursday, 3 p.m. to 9 p.m., and then Friday and Saturday, 11 a.m. to 10 p.m., and Sunday, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m., and then you guys have hours on Thanksgiving week, which are extended 11 a.m. to 9 p.m. That's next week. It's hard to believe, isn't it? Yes, um, we do have extended hours around those holiday breaks to make sure you can bring your family early and really get in a full day of entertainment. Um, the only day we're closed is Christmas Day. Wow. So you're going to be open a little bit on Christmas Eve. Winter break has extended hours. Here, here's what I'll tell you. It, it, like I said, for me, it's just get there and experience. If you haven't done it yet, there, there's nothing to me, like I said, the first time you guys did it outside, I thought it was really cool. And it's like, like I said, it's just, it's fun to be around Wrigleyville, you know, especially when there's no baseball. And so you get to do that. And then not only that, but also the neighborhoods just jump and there's a lot of bars. Uh, Lucky Doors is one of my favorites. They have this, what is it? Brandy apple cider, hot apple cider drink that absolutely just it gets me in trouble sometimes, but there's a lot of places that you can go in the Wrigleyville area that, that just have a lot of uh, Christmas pop-up bars. If you haven't been down there, it is, it is an absolute blast. And, and for, especially if you're a Cub fan, who's never been there, all I can do is, is I can't recommend it enough. Uh, Shana. And that's why I wanted you on here is, is, is to let people know that this is coming up starting on Tuesday with the tree lighting ceremony and then going all the way through what close to right before Cubs convention. Yes. Um, so the winter lane goes through January 7th. Um, Chris Kill market will be open through new year's Eve, but then you can still do all the ballpark activities through that next week of the 7th. Right. And then Cubs con is the weekend after that. So you can get all your Cubs fill, but it really truly is a special time. And I'm now, you've now got me thinking about the tropical igloo and the bleachers. So I'm now going to start digging into all this stuff, but definitely go to Gallagher's website, Gallagher way website to get all the information that you need. Correct. Yes, GallagherWay.com is your one-stop shop for all of the information on Winterland. Shane, I appreciate you so much for coming on. And and again, I hope to see you out at Winterland. And, and I will definitely be there with my s'mores, maybe even in an igloo. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. We look forward to seeing you and your family. Well, that's a wrap. Don't forget to listen, download, review, and subscribe to the Fly the W podcast. Follow us on the socials, Fly the W Facebook. Instagram. We're on Twitter. Of course, you can email Crawley and I, fly the W670 at gmail.com. And you can watch us on YouTube by subscribing to the 670 score YouTube channel. Crowley, have a great Thanksgiving, but I think we're going to try to squeeze one more episode in before Turkey Day. I'm not saying everybody will be able to consume it before then, but you and I are going to try to record on Wednesday as well. Absolutely. And I do want to thank everybody that had such kind words to talk, say about the, about the podcast at the Sports Spectacular this last weekend. Uh, like those guys, please make sure you leave those five-star reviews and go Cubs. 
Hey guys, it's Crawley. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Links are in the description. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you in the next video. Go Cubs!